Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 16th annual lecture in Jewish Christian Engagement, co-sponsored by the Bennett Center for Judaic Studies and the Center for Catholic Studies here at Fairfield University. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ellen Umansky, the Carl and Dorothy Bennett Professor of Judaic Studies and Director of the Bennett Center. On behalf of myself and Dr. Paul Lakeland, Aloysius P. Kelly, Professor of Catholic Studies and Director of our Catholic Studies Center, I want to welcome all of you, both those of you here in person and those of you who are with us virtually, to this very special evening. This annual lecture series gives us the opportunity to think theologically, historically, and culturally about Judaism and Christianity and to engage our religious traditions and ourselves in dialogue with one another. Focusing on the hard questions, questions that often are not raised for fear that they might seem too radical, heretical, even to one's own faith community, or on the other hand, remarks that might offend, exclude, or suggest the supersession of the other. A discussion of the papal encyclical Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis's 2020 letter on fraternity and social friendship, the notion that all of us really are, quote, brothers or siblings, might not seem all that radical. In fact, one might think it's an idea that all non-Christians and all non-Christian religions would welcome. Yet, as I think Rabbi Vysotsky will ask, are there limitations to interreligious dialogue? Are we really all brothers? And if we are, should we be wary of sibling rivalry? Rabbi Burton Fasatsky is Appelman Professor of Midrash and Interreligious Studies Emeritus at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, where he joined the faculty following his rabbinic ordination in 1977. He was dean of the Jewish Theological Seminary Graduate School and founding rabbi of the Egalitarian Women's League Seminary Synagogue. He continues to serve as director of the Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies at JTS, which does programming on public policy, and directs JTS's Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue. Professor Fasatsky holds a Master of Education degree from Harvard University and a PhD from the Jewish Theological Seminary. He has been visiting faculty at Oxford University and Cambridge University in England. He has taught at Princeton University and Princeton Theological Seminary and at the Russian State University of the Humanities in Moscow. He has been an adjunct faculty member of Union Theological Seminary in New York City, which is really diagonally across the street from the Jewish Theological Seminary since 1980. Rabbi Vysotsky served as Master Visiting Professor of Jewish Studies at the, Pontific at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, where he met Pope Benedict in 2007. And he has been teaching there, albeit virtually, this semester. In 2014, Professor Fasatsky served as Distinguished Visiting Professor at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum in Rome, where he met Pope Francis. He has published in America, Europe, and Israel. The author of 10 books, editor of seven other volumes, and the author of over 125 articles and reviews his recent book, Aphrodite and the Rabbis, How the Jews Adapted Roman Culture to Create Judaism as We Know It, was published in 2016. And his co-edited three-volume, 1,000-page compendium on Jewish history, literature, and modern culture was published in 2020-2021 by Kohlhammer as part of their distinguished series, The Religions of Humanity. Bert Fasotsky served on the United States Holocaust Museum's Committee on Ethics, Religion, and the Holocaust from 2011 until 2019. And in 2015, was a founding member of the Roundtable of Religious and Faith-Based Organization Leaders, advising the World Bank President, Jim Yong Kim. 
He currently serves on the steering committee of the Plan of Action for Religious Leaders to Prevent Incitement to, a, to Atrocity Crimes for the United Nations Under Secretary General for Genocide Prevention and is a life member of the UN's Council on Foreign Relations. Rabbi Fasatsky participates in interreligious engagement in places as diverse as Jerusalem, Rome, Vienna, Cairo, Marrakesh, Doha, and Abu Dhabi. In 2017, he joined the Board of Governors of the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations, the official body representing the Jewish people to the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, Islam, and other international religious denominations. He serves on the Executive Committee of Shoulder to Shoulder, a multi-faith campaign against anti-Muslim bigotry, and on the Standing Committee on Strengthening Interreligious Education of Religions for Peace International. Rabbi Fasatsky has been named to the Forward 50 and repeatedly to the Newsweek Daily Beast list of the 50 most influential Jews in America. I first met Professor Fasatsky several years ago at the annual meeting of the CCJR, the Council of Centers on Jewish-Christian Relations. Although I knew of him and his work long before that, it was at this meeting, which with Mary Boys of Union Theological Seminary, he helped host in New York City, I was struck, as I still am, by his energy and enthusiasm, his deep-seated critical thinking, an obvious interest and active involvement in interreligious dialogue. A strong indicator of this being the many people at this conference I attended, I was amazed at how many people at the conference he actually knew. I am delighted that Bert Fisoski accepted Paul Lakeland's and my invitation to deliver this year's lecture in Jewish Christian engagement and to agree to be with us in person. Paul and I want to thank Jennifer Hainos, program, set, program manager of the Bennett Center, Mary Crimmins, administrative coordinator of the Catholic Studies Center, and Anthony Santora in the university's media center for all of their help with this evening's event. Following Rabbi Visotsky's talk, Dr. Lakeland will offer an informal response, which will be followed by a question and answer session with Professor Fazatsky. Those of us who are joining us via a Zoom webinar are invited to type in any questions they might have into the Q&A box, either during the lecture or immediately after. And having given these brief announcements and introduction, please join me in welcoming to Fairfield University to deliver the 16th annual lecture in Jewish Christian engagement on Fratelli Tutti, the Good Samaritan, and the Rabbi, Rabbi Bert Fasatsky. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yamansky. Um, I'm, I'm glad I had the cannoli and the espresso because now you're going to expect me to be all energetic. Um, and I, I'm grateful that you read the entire um, description. Um, my mom wrote it, so it's, uh, it's a little over the top, uh, but uh, it's, it's really lovely to be here at Fairfield University, and I feel a little bit like this is my, my Catholic week um, in, in the broad semester that I'm living out uh, since I retired from my full-time teaching position at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Last Thursday, I was engaged in a dialogue with the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C., um, His Eminence Wilton Cardinal Gregory. And then on Monday, at my own seminary at JTS, we hosted for Ramadan an interreligious iftar dinner, and we had hizmet um, Turkish Muslims, and to spice it up a little, we invited seminarians from St. Joseph's Seminary in Yonkers. So they came down, and they came down in full regalia, and I, I confess, all of the women rabbinical students were envious of their garb. They, they all wanted that. Um, and then on Wednesday, my rabbinical students, a dozen of us, we went up to St. Joe's Seminary 
to have dinner and a conversation with those same seminarians on the topic of calling. That was just last night. And to the eternal credit of Bishop James Massa, we had a strictly kosher meal for all of us. So it was really quite lovely. I'm going to come back to that notion of a Catholic making sure that the meal is kosher. But before I start my lecture, I want to say a few words. Um, and what I want to do is actually talk about an earlier encyclical of Pope Francis, one that he wrote in 2015. Um, at the time, he wrote a, an encyclical called Laudato Si, which is an exquisite document. Um, if you have not read it, it is worth every minute of your time. You can download it, just Google it, Laudato Si. It is his encyclical on the climate crisis. And Pope Francis did his homework. Really, everything he says there has been proven all the more so now seven years later. And I got involved with my colleagues at Fordham University, another Catholic university not far from the Jewish Theological Seminary. And at Francis's request, we formed a study group of Jews and Catholics learning paragraph by paragraph the contents of Laudato Si. We very quickly realized that this was an opportunity we shouldn't pass up. So we invited some Muslim colleagues, some Protestant colleagues, and chief among those Protestant colleagues was my own colleague across the street from JTS, as you mentioned, at Union Theological Seminary, the head of their Center for Earth Ethics. Her name is Karena Gore. She is the daughter of Vice President Al Gore. And uh, that's a family that is deeply dedicated to saving the earth. And when Pope Francis invited our study group to come to Rome for a conference on Laudato Si. We didn't send Catholics and we didn't send Jews. We wound up sending a Protestant and a Muslim to represent us because they were the two who were best spoke on the issue of Laudato Si. I want to make it clear that if Pope Francis can reach out to the Jewish community, whether it be in Buenos Aires or in New York, that we have very good relations with this Pope. His Holiness is really a friend of the Jewish community. We have gone from what his eminence, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, my local archbishop um, in New York City, Tim Dolan referred to what we used to have as a dialogue of grievance. Yes, we would dialogue, but, and I'm quoting um, his eminence, we would quetch a lot to each other. Um, you can tell that uh, Cardinal Dolan has been in New York a long time. His Yiddish is impeccable. Um, but we are moving, and Dolan wants this to happen, and as I said last Thursday, I was in conference with His Eminence Wilton Cardinal Gregory. Um, Cardinal Gregory simply said, well, why don't we just set as our goal friendship? Now that sounds so simple, but I want to remind you, and I'm looking in this room, I can't see who's out there online, but in this room, the average age is pretty young, and you have no memory thank God, of the 2,000 years of enmity between the church and the synagogue. It wasn't just that we didn't talk to each other. Church and synagogue, Catholics and Jews, hated one another. Jews said all kind of nasty things about Catholics, and in turn, Catholics did all kind of nasty things to Jews. It was not pretty. It was not good to be a Jew in a Catholic country. We were often as not expelled from those countries, sometimes as much as for 500 years. We were murdered. We were tortured. We were forced to convert. So the fact that we can now, after Vatican II, after Nostra Aetate in 1965, so how many years is that? 35 and 22 is? Someone here must do math. 50-something? 50 57, thank you. Um, Professor Umansky, you get the math point. Um, so after 57 years, the fact that we can be talking about friendship, that I, a rabbi, can be invited to a Catholic university to talk about something Pope Francis wrote, it's nothing short of astonishing. And I want to challenge everyone online and everyone in this room that that friendship should result in us working together to do the things that God wants of us, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to give shelter to the unhoused. 
just how friendly are we after two millennia of enmity? I want to tell you a story that when I was t teaching a couple of years ago in Buenos Aires, my friend, Rabbi Avram Skorka, told me this tale. Now, Avi Skorka is a, a bit older than me, and when he was in charge of the rabbinic seminary in Buenos Aires, the local archbishop was a man named Bergoglio, or as you know him now, Pope Francis. And Bergoglio and Avi Skorka bonded over being soccer fans, and they rooted for different teams, so they ribbed each other constantly. And this was the start of a beautiful friendship. The one book that Pope Francis wrote before he became Pope, apparently when you're Pope you write books all the time because you know you have guaranteed sales, but when he was Archbishop, it was a risk. And the one and only book he wrote was a dialogue book that he wrote with Avi Skorka. Skorka tells me the following story. The last day of the fall festival of Sukkot is called Shmini Atzeret. If you know your Bible, you know that it is the quintessential generic holiday. It's kind of a holiday on which Jews celebrate, thank God the holidays are finally over and we can get back to work. It's just really not a significant day, and yet it is a holiday, which means that observant Jews won't travel, won't work, won't write, won't use money. And Skorka says that he knew he was going to be in Rome on his way from Jerusalem back to Buenos Aires. So he reached out to his friend, Pope Francis, and he said, Francisco. Actually, I don't know, for all I know, he still called him Jorge, which was his um, name before he became Pope. I'm going to be in Rome. Can we see one another? And Pope Francis says, Avi, my friend, you're going to be here. Of course, let's do lunch. And Skorka says, well, I, I have trouble because the hotel I usually stay at is quite far from the Vatican. So the Pope says, well, stay with me at Santa Marta. Santa Marta is a hotel for bishops. Pope Francis, it, and it really tells you who he is, does not live in the royal papal apartments. He lives in a room in a hotel for bishops, and he, he boards there with the other bishops. It's really quite extraordinary, his humility. So he says to Skorka, so you'll stay with me, I'll get a room for you at, at Santa Marta, and we'll have the whole day to just schmooze, I don't know if he used that word, um, but to get together and reminisce and talk about what we need to do as Jews and Catholics. Avi Skorka says, well, that's good, but I do have to eat, and I don't think you have kosher food at Santa Marta. And Pope Francis says, not to worry, I'll be your supervisor of kosher food. And sure enough, he was. He made sure that the meal was kosher. So now they get there. Avi unpacks, it's time for dinner, it's the Jewish holiday. He comes in with the Holy Father. Everybody stands up, it's the Pope. Pope sits everybody down, they sit down, he says to Avi, now what? Avi says, well, at the beginning of a meal, we say Kiddush. Pope says, what's Kiddush? He says, well, we take a cup of wine, and the Pope says, yeah, we got that. <laughs> he says, but we make a blessing, and we bless the day, and we thank God for the wine. Pope says, okay, let's do it. So Karkas says, but we stand up when we say Kiddush. So Pope Francis says, okay, you stand, I stand. So of course, when the Pope stands, every bishop in the room stands. And now Rabbi Skorka recites Kiddush in Hebrew. And then the Pope says, what was that? And he says, let me translate. He translates into Spanish, their common language. The Pope repeats it in Italian. And when the Pope finishes, all the bishops in the room say, Amen. Now, I guarantee you that is the first time in history that the Pope and a room full of bishops said amen to the benediction of a rabbi. And it was an extraordinary moment. And I'm sharing it with you, not just so that you know what an extraordinary time we live in, but that you know Pope Francis and you know his heart and you know how not only humble he is, but how sincere he is in his love of his Jewish brothers and sisters. Now I want to come to Fratelli Tutti. And I want to tell you, and uh, Professor Umansky alluded to it, it was not written about the relationship of Catholics and Jews. No, it was written on the occasion of an event that took place in the United Arab Emirates, at which time 
Pope Francis signed a document of human fraternity, that's what it's called, the document of human fraternity, we'll assume sorority as well, um, with the head of the Arab Muslim institution in Cairo, Al-Azhar. In theory, the head of Al-Azhar, the sheikh as he is called, is kind of the Muslim equivalent of the Pope, except unlike the Pope, who in theory Catholics pay attention to, um, the head of Al-Azhar may as well be a rabbi, which is to say nobody pays attention to him. He has the authority in theory, but maybe not so much in practice. So they signed this document in Abu Dhabi, the document of human fraternity, and there is the crown prince of Abu Dhabi, Mohammed bin Zayed, and the head of Al-Azhar, Ahmed Al-Tayeb. Now, before I go further, I want to tell you that Ahmad Al-Tayeb is also a wonderful outreach dialoguer. Ahmed Al-Tayeb came to the Jewish Theological Seminary. He came to us so that we would know that the head of an Arab state of Egypt wanted to have dialogue with the Jewish community. So this is a very big deal. These two great leaders of Islam and Catholicism, we're talking about leaders of two to three billion people on the face of the earth, are there. I just want to go back for a moment, though, because when Ahmed Al-Tayeb was at JTS, he was not yet the head of Al-Azhar. There was a different sheikh then named Al-Tantawi. Al-Tantawi came along as well, so there's one old man. There's Ahmed Al-Tayeb, who I don't want to call an old man because he's my age, a very young man. And then they were babysat, if you will, by a woman who was the highest ranking diplomat in Egypt. She was the assistant foreign minister for religion and culture. Her name was Salama Shakar. And she made sure everybody got to where they were supposed to get to. Everything was properly diplomatic. And she was quite lovely. And like any good Muslim woman, um, she had a scarf to just be sure she could cover her hair just in case. I couldn't help but notice the scarf was Hermes. But all right, you know, you need a scarf. You need a scarf. May as well be a nice one. Salama in New York says to me, Bert, you know, when you come to Egypt, I want to host you now. What she didn't know, this was in November, was that my family and I had already planned a trip to Egypt in December. So it was a funny moment because in New York City, I don't know how many of you go into the city, but in New York City, if somebody says, let's do lunch, that basically means they're never going to see you again. So here is Salama Shakar. She's saying, let's do lunch. And I say to her, well, we will arrive in Cairo on December 19th. And she says, tell me your hotel. I tell her the hotel. She says, I know it well. My husband and I will pick you up at noon. And sure enough, at noon on that day, their two cars come. They pick up me, my wife, my two kids, the two travel companions we're with. And they bring us to downtown Cairo, just off Tahrir Square. If those of you remember the uh, Muslim Spring, that's where all the riots took place. But we were in one of the fancy places, it's called the Diplomats Club, and we walk in and there are literally Nubian waiters, these tall black Africans in full tribal dress, wearing white gloves, to serve us. I realized with horror that I neglected to mention to Salama Shakar that I keep kosher. And I knew that she would feed me food and that I wouldn't be able to eat it and it would be a horrible insult, a diplomatic moment. And I look at the spread and everything is vegetarian. She was that good at what she did. So it was curious when her cell phone rang that she started jabbering away very quickly in Arabic, way quicker than I could keep track of, because I know like three words. Um, and after about really three, four, five minutes of talking, and I was starting to think it's kind of rude. She hands me the cell phone and says, it's for you. I was like, really? I get on the cell phone, and in very broken English, 
Ahmed Al Tayeb, the same guy who's now the head of Al Azhar, says, Rabbi, you know, I really meant to show up for lunch with you. I really wanted to be there. I wanted to pay my respects. You had me in your house. Now you're in our country. But something came up. I had to go down to Luxor. So I promise you, the next time you're in Egypt, I will host you. I'm still waiting to go back to Egypt and collect. And I'm fairly certain that if I reach out to him, he will indeed host us. These are men of good will. That's what you need to know. There is enormous goodwill. And that's why it's painful to me to have to fetch a little and revert for a moment tonight to the dialogue of grievance regarding Fratelli Tutti. When my kids were small and they had play dates, I learned that if there was a play date with two children, my child and somebody else, things generally were okay. But the minute there was a third kid, you had the triangle problem. Two kids would play and they'd ice out the third child. And the same is true in interreligious international dialogue. When Muslims and Catholics are in dialogue, the Jews are always a little nervous that we're going to get blamed for whatever is the problem. And indeed, it made us nervous. This was exacerbated by the fact that just last year, in August of 21, the Pope was teaching about the Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Okay, he's Pope. He's teaching New Testament. That's kind of his job, right? But when he got to an interpretation of Paul, it raised more than a few Jewish eyebrows. Pope said, and I'm quoting now, the law, however, does not give life. Jesus gives life, the law does not give life. Now, that's an old supersessionist theology that Catholic doctrine, Christian doctrine, Jesus had come to replace the law, the Torah, because Jesus gives life, but Jews don't have access to life unless we accept Christ. And we didn't like hearing it way back when, but we especially don't like hearing it since Vatican II, because Nostra Aetate, that marvelous document of Vatican II, refuted, repudiated this doctrine. Vatican II was very careful to say that the gifts and the promise of the Jews are eternal, and that the law is to the Jews salvific, it brings salvation, much as Christ does to Christians. So it's very disturbing to hear this from the Pope, who I know to be a friend of the Jews. And it left me mystified. And when I get to talking about Fratelli Tutti, you'll see why I have a problem. When Jews protested, the chief rabbi of Israel wrote a letter, and the head of what um, Ellen mentioned, Ijkik, the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultation, which is a group of Jews representing the entirety of world Jewry, and particularly to the Catholic Church. Ijkik started when after Vatican II, the church quietly came to the leaders of a number of Jewish organizations and said, you know, in the church there is a hierarchy. We have one pope. He can't meet with every single Jew. Would you please form a committee? And so Ijkik was formed. And this is how now we presumably represent, of course every Jew still wants to meet with the pope, but there's this committee, and we have the opportunity when we're in Rome, um, God willing, I'll be in Rome at the end of June for Vatican consultations, and again, we will meet with the Pope. So the head of Ijkik and the chief rabbi of Israel wrote letters of protest. Now, we wrote letters of protest according to Vatican II protocol. According to Nostra Aetate, that document about the church's relations with other religions, there is a organization which is called the Church's Committee for Relations with the Jews. And His Eminence Kurt Cardinal Koch is the head of that committee. He's the president of the commission. When Kurt Koch, who I know well, got that letter, these letters of protest, he was very dismissive. He said, the Torah is not devalued. You're misreading the document. The Pope's comments, I'm quoting now, should be considered within the overall framework of Paul's theology. 
And he made it maybe a little worse by saying, and besides, there's no mention of modern Judaism in the Pope's comments. If you can hear that just for a moment with Jewish ears, try, you realize it's a very unsatisfactory response. It, in fact, made things maybe a little worse because it really wasn't what we wanted to hear. And Cardinal Koch was basically saying, there you Jews go again. You're being hypersensitive. Last week, when I was in dialogue with his eminence, Wilton Cardinal Gregory, I asked him about the teaching of Galatians. And Cardinal Gregory, bless his sweetheart, said, I'm quoting him now, sometimes friends make mistakes. There was a cardinal, a prince of the church, criticizing the pope. He said, of course the pope is friends with the Jews. He made an error. So like, wow. Now that was a satisfying answer because I know that Cardinal Gregory is a friend of the Jewish community. He, by the way, is in the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishop tasked with relations with the Jewish community. And it's no accident that he is the first African-American cardinal to be named a cardinal. Um, in the Jewish community, we think of him as a mensch, a bubala. He's a doll. He's just a wonderful, wonderful human being. But he gave us a very good answer. Yes, the Pope taught what he taught, but he was just wrong. He made a mistake. And I can live with that. Popes can make mistakes. Even rabbis can make mistakes. It happens. Now I can turn to Fratelli Tutti. Fratelli Tutti is a long document. It is, by the way, worth reading because it really outlines the Pope's hopes for friendship between Catholics and Muslims and along the way, Catholics and Jews. But in paragraph 56, the Pope quotes something that I hope you all know well, which is the parable of the Good Samaritan. I want to share it with you. Here's how it goes. This is from the Gospel of Luke. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Lawyer, the Greek is nomikos. It probably means a rabbi. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Those are indeed Jesus' notion of the two great commandments each time Jesus is quoting the Torah text. The rabbi says to Jesus, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify him, to shtuck him a little more, he says to Jesus, and who's my neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? And Jesus replied with the following story. A man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They mugged him, they stripped him, they beat him, and they went away and left him half dead. Now by chance, a priest, a Kohen, that means a priest in the Jerusalem temple, was going down that road, and when he saw that wounded man, he passed to the other side. So likewise, a Levite, who also serves in the temple, when he came to that place and saw him, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went and bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on them. He put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. And the next day took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever you spend. Then Jesus says, which of these do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the rabbi has to say, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go now and do likewise. That's Luke chapter 10. I want to say that in Jesus' time, in the first century, this was an inner Jewish argument. Jesus was, after all, a Jew, as was Paul, as were the disciples. And what Jesus did not like was the fact that the 
people who were, by their virtue of their parentage, charged with running the temple in Jerusalem, that out of their worry that they might become ritually unfit, rather than take care of a wounded man, they avoided him. That's a critique of the leadership of the temple by other Jews. Now, let's listen to what Francis has to say. Francis says, in earlier Jewish, I'm quoting, in earlier Jewish traditions, this is paragraph 59 for those of you that are following at home, the imperative to love and care for others appears to have been limited to relationships between members of the same nation. The ancient commandment to love your neighbor as yourself referred to your fellow citizens, especially in the Judaism developed outside the land of Israel. Now this is just wrong. It's wrong morally and ethical and it's wrong as historic fact. Historically, Jews have always interpreted the command, love your neighbor as yourself, to mean your neighbor, whomever you live near. It doesn't make a difference if they're a Jew or a non-Jew. If they are your neighbor, you are commanded to love them. Indeed, just a few verses later, the Torah makes explicit that your neighbor is the one who is not Jewish. That's who we're commanded to love. And there was no distinction between in the land of Israel or outside of the land of Israel. So Pope Francis, bless his sweetheart, made a mistake. And it's a big one because he's now reading the parable of the Good Samaritan as an indictment of Jews, not just those who are serving in the temple. And he's saying that Jews were very insular. We were clannish. We only took care of our own. We didn't look out for others. And I have to say, with all due deference, and when I see him, I will say it as well, Pope Francis, you're wrong. You're wrong as a matter of fact. You're wrong as a matter of interpretation. You're wrong as a matter of theology. There are a number of other paragraphs where Pope Francis, and I want to say this, I believe inadvertently gives offense to Jews. But that means that twice now, first in 2020 with Fratelli Tutti, and then in August of 2021 with his interpretation of Galatians, Pope Francis has offended the Jewish community in ways that we normally associate with pre-Vatican II Catholic anti-Semitism. And that hurts. It hurts me as a Jew, but it also hurts me as someone who loves Pope Francis and thinks that he is a great, great religious leader. So what went wrong? What went wrong? How is it that the Pope could make such an error after having such a good track record as a friend of the Jewish community? And not only that, he did it in a homily and maybe worse, in a papal encyclical. So part of me is worried about the Curia in Rome, that somebody stuck this in and Pope Francis wasn't paying enough attention. That's a possibility, because as you may know, Rome is a tough place, and there are a lot of people who do not like the progressive attitudes of Pope Francis. So if they can drag him back, they may. I also want to suggest something that I learned in the Talmud. The Talmud refers to, in Aramaic, the term girsa di ankuta. It means what you learned as a child. And the Talmud says what you learned as a child is what sticks with you. Why am I so sensitive to Jewish Catholic relations? Because I was a child before Vatican II. And that means that as a child, I had the dubious experience of being called a Christ killer. I had no idea what it meant, but I knew it wasn't a compliment. And since it followed by getting beaten up, I certainly knew it wasn't a compliment. I lived through that. So I'm nervous that reflexively an 85-year-old pope just taught what he remembered that he had learned as a child back when it was still okay to be disrespectful to the Jews. And I want to reemphasize that through actions and writing both before and since, Pope Francis has demonstrated his loyalty to Vatican II, to Nostra Aetate, and to the Jewish community. So I want to end with a prayer that as we move forward, the Holy Father will exercise more care 
towards the sensitivities of Jesus and Paul's Jewish people, especially we who listen with care and work, it's our life's work, to have good relations between Jews and Catholics so that we might do the will of our Father in heaven. Thank you. Paul, it's time for your rebuttal. So thank you, uh, Rabbi Bozatsky, for, for those words. I have to think that the Pope himself would probably be listening and uh, smiling wryly. And uh, after all, he's, he's done things as a Pope for the first time in many ways. And I think uh, he's certainly the first Pope I ever heard say in public, I am a sinner. And I dare say that uh, what you're talking about here, it's not, it's not just he made a mistake. He made a mistake that's a little bit more than a mistake. Uh, he makes all sorts of mistakes, too, uh, some of which um, might go back to the same thing you're saying, might go back to the notion that what he learned as a child has stuck with him. I think most women in the Catholic Church would consider that the Pope, to say the least, uh, the Pope, uh, to say the least, has a blind spot. Um, he has done a lot to advance the place of women, especially in Rome. But there are limits to the way in which he thinks about women that really reflect, you know, a, a very, reflect the fact that he's an old Argentinian gentleman. So what I thought I would do just a very few minutes is to just go stay with uh, stay with the parable of the Good Samaritan a little bit, because I, I think um, one of the problems with the parable of the Good Samaritan as it has been taught within, within the Christian tradition, and certainly in my experience within the Catholic Christian tradition, is that it's taught in a way that is unreciprocal. So, if you think about the story as, as the rabbi just read it to you, there is a bleeding, wounded man in a ditch. And he is helped by a Samaritan. And a Samaritan uh, in Jesus' time was generally not uh, a person was greatly respected. He was a heretic of sorts, to, at least to Orthodox Jews. So he's picked out here in Jesus' story, this is a, a way of saying to people not only that we have to be neighbors to everyone, but that those who help us might very well be people that we would not expect to be helped by. The first way this story is preached is always about how we have to be like the Good Samaritan and help the person who is in need. And there is in that the potential for a little bit of uh, Christian hubris that, you know, even at our very best, even as we try to be not uh, dismissive of other traditions. Nevertheless, in that story, we will see ourselves in the role of the provider, of the do-gooder. And a, it's a good thing to do, of course. It's a very good thing to help those who need help. What I think we don't think about enough is that we might, while at times, we are in the role the Samaritan played, the provider. We are also at times the wounded victim in need of help. That's true for Christians, it's true for Muslims, it's true for Jews. So that in this parable, there is the seeds of a healthily reciprocal relationship between differing religious traditions. There are times when it is our responsibility to care for others. 
and there are times when it is our honor to be cared for by others. That kind of uh, understanding of the parable might be something that you could suggest to Pope Francis when you see him. Thank you so much for your talk. That's all I'm going to say. And uh, at this point then, you in the, in the room here or the many of you online have an opportunity to raise a question for, uh, for Rabbi Vazotsky. So let's, let's start by asking if there's someone in the room who would like but to. Before we get there, I, I do want to comment on, on what you said because it strikes such a positive chord with me. I believe you are correct that the parable of the Good Samaritan teaches us that sometimes we need to be the Samaritan. And sometimes we are the victim who needs the attention. But I want to nuance it a little further because I think we have to own the possibility that sometimes we're the priest and the Levite who walk, aw who walk away. We have to own that. I live in Manhattan. And I cannot walk the mile and a quarter from my apartment to my seminary without seeing lots of street people, now what we call them, the unhoused, um, beggars, the wounded, the crazies, the ones who frighten you, or the ones who are covered with sores or sleeping on the street. I Confess I do not know the calculus by which I give money to some and avoid others. Why sometimes I will stop and talk with someone who's clearly just hungry for human conversation and other times almost literally cross the street. So I have to own that too. That sometimes I am the Samaritan, sometimes I am the needy one, and I think you put your figure on, on something very powerful. It's hard to accept help. That takes courage. But I also have to say, sometimes I'm the guy that walks by. So there really are three characters, and each of those three characters is us. Okay, there were lots of hands, or have I allayed them all? <laughs> and I have a microphone. You can ask your questions into the microphone. Yes. Um, I'm just thinking that after Vatican II, when I was taking classes in uh, the Hebrew scriptures for a year, and then the New Testament, and I did fall in love with the Old Testament and, and the Jewish teachings there, um, that I had never learned as a Catholic that the great virtue of hospitality for Christians came through the example of Abraham when he was visited by those three strangers who were the angels in disguise. And I've always thought about that. And I always feel kind of built up when I can show hospitality to anyone or everyone. It's a good feeling, but that came after I learned about um, the meaning of, of hospitality through Abraham and Sarah cooking and, and, and uh, inviting them to spend time with them. And this is unrelated, but I used to work for uh, a magazine in Manhattan for many years. And uh, Christmas time, they always had a kind of a famous place, a kind of a Christmas party afterwards. But I had a two-hour commute back home mm -hmm. to my children, so I very rarely went. But one year I did, because it, it was two blocks from Grand Central or something, so it didn't take a lot of time for me. And I came out of this fancy restaurant where all the uh, magazine people had gathered and were partying away be just before Christmas. And I came out, and almost directly in front of the doors was a subway grate, and there was a man lying on the grate directly. And I saw him, and I never had much money <laughs> to spend in those days because I was raising my family. Uh, but I had like $3, and I, I walked past him, 
it was maybe half a block, and I turned around and I went back because I remember reading that a priest had said one time, whenever a beggar asks me for something, I always give it. And people say I'm a fool because he might be using it for lick or whatever. And the priest said, that's not my responsibility. You know, my responsibility is to give when it's asked of me. So I went back with my paltry $3 bills. That's all I had. And he was lying on his left side towards the street on the grate. And I saw he had a pocket, outside pocket on his raggedy jacket. And I just folded those three bills up and I tucked him in his pocket as gently as I could. And he immediately turned over and looked at me. And I've never seen blue eyes so clear so full of love, so it was an astounding blessing to me. And at that moment, and I, I, I'll see it till I die, there was no difference between him and me. We were exactly the same. And three bucks is nothing. He couldn't even buy a drink with that. But it impressed me that... Um, I, I had had the experience maybe 10 or 12 years before hearing this priest say, when a beggar asks for something, you give it and leave the judgment up to God. So I, I want to say bless you, that that was a great, a great blessing. And it's still not clear to me hearing your story all these years later, whether it was a great blessing to, greater blessing to you or to him. Or to me. But I do want to quote not just your priest, but a very impressive first century rabbi who said, as you treat the least of them, that is how you treat me. So uh, good on you. I also want to say, just as a little commentary on the story of Abraham receiving visitors, that my rabbis comment that Abraham made a point of pitching his tent at a crossroads so he could see who was coming and prepare in advance. And one other midrash, one other commentary says, and Abraham, when he pitched his tent, very unusually put the flaps on all four sides up so he could look north, south, east, west and never miss the opportunity to invite a guest into his home. And I want to give you that charge. It's uh, whatever your, uh, if you're one of the Abrahamic religions, you have Easter coming, you have Ramadan, we have Passover. Um, invite someone to your table who you might not normally have and it will change your celebration and your religious life. Uh, so we have a question from the online, the, the hundred or so people online. Uh, it's a very straight, simple question, so it's a big one. Are you ready? How do we begin to dialogue about the question of covenant? I think the first thing we do is we begin to dialogue. That is to say, if you start with covenant, that's climbing almost literally a very high mountain. Um, start with friendship. Start with finding out what you share in common. The dialogue that we had last night at St. Joseph's Seminary, rabbinical students and priests talked about what made them decide to go on to the path to become clergy. And midway through the dialogue, the rabbinical students, it was like the penny drop for them. It was like, you know, we decided to go to rabbinical school. You guys are going to like, you're taking a vow of celibacy. Like, Oh my God, uh, like now let's go back and start over. And I think it's true with all dialogue that you start taking steps together and at a certain point you realize what the stakes are. And then you may have to start over, but you're starting over as friends. And as friends you can talk about, so what is the nature of the covenant? And to whom is the covenant? Um, Jews certainly, we believe that we are covenant uh, in a covenant relationship with God, so much so that Jewish men say that the covenant is on my body. I'm not going to explain further. Um, if you don't know, Professor Umansky will explain it to you af afterwards. Um, so what do I feel when a Christian, a Catholic, comes to me and says, but I have a covenant with God as well? And my response is, yes, you do. Of course you do. God has covenant with all of humanity. Our creator created us to be in relationship. 
and if I love God, therefore I must love my fellow human being. And that means the non-Jew as well as the Jew. And it means respecting the fact that if the church says that there is a covenant, a covenant with the Gentiles, then I say, Amen. Next. Yes, a question from here by one of the students. Any student here brave enough to ask a question? Oh, or, well, Paul, you're not a student, but okay, we'll let you ask. While he's asking his question, the next question from this room should please be from someone under the age of 30. Somebody else then. No, you first, but then them. Um, this is not to excuse the Pope, but I'm just in an effort to understand what he did in those two instances. Do you think what he it was really about was a critique within the church, you know, in the sense of, in the Galatians reference, he's going after people he sees as his opponents who within perhaps the Curia or other parts of the church who he feels are too legalistic in terms of how they interpret church law and put doctrine ahead of pastoral outreach, for instance, uh, and that something similar may be going on also, you know, perhaps in, in his concern for the way in which uh, immigrants are treated or refugees are treated, that he, he is playing a little fast and loose as a kind of way, and I'm not saying this excuses it, but maybe explains what is going on in his, his rhetorical uh, tactic in both instances. I, I appreciate what you're saying because the Pope is incredibly well-known and well-deserved for his compassion. He cares about other people. And maybe he is sly enough, and he has on occasion been that sly, to use a homily to critique those people in the Curia that perhaps he disagrees with and who he knows are coming after him. That said, I think he still might be guilty of not having appreciated how his Jewish brothers and sisters would hear his interpretation. I've read, and I wish I could remember the, the source of this quote, that to love someone is to know what it is that hurts them. And I want him to know that. I want him to know that he says things that are hurtful. And by and large, and when I say by and large, he's been Pope a while now, and he was a Cardinal Archbishop for a long time before that. He has been almost picture perfect on his relations with the Jews. So maybe I'm being unfair, and I'm judging him for two statements out of a zillion. On the other hand, the rest of them are so loving and so compassionate that I think I have a right to an expectation that he be careful when he teaches and not lapse. And even if you're right that he is giving an internal critique of his churchmen, um, it still stung us. Okay, what about you youngins here? You know, you're all wearing shirts that have words on them, so I'm just gonna call by, by calling a word and then you'll I be on the spot. I want you to know that all those who are here from Professor Merritt's class, she's online and she's watching. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, who'd like to uh, get a little extra credit? Come on, come on. I mean, I was watching, you guys really were awake. I know you were listening. I see somebody rubbing his chin, which is usually an indication he's about to ask a question. <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, let me ask you a question. Do you think that my, my kvetch, my complaint about the Pope is fair? Or do you think I'm just like zeroing in on a couple of statements and I'm hypersensitive? No, I think it's fair. Uh, I get that what he said could be hurtful to you. And uh, he wasn't careful with those two statements. So, I, you know, uh, Professor Lakeland alluded to this. I, I have had the incredible privilege of meeting with the Pope a number of times. And usually, you know, it's, it's a very awkward meeting. He never remembers my name. Uh, <laughs> duh. Um, and I always remember who he is. And, you know, he's always the guy in white. I'm always the guy in black. Um, but um, if I have the opportunity, let's say at the end of June, to be in an audience with the Pope, 
what can I say to him? How, how do I say to him, you know, I've been following, I listen carefully to everything you say, and recently you said some things that, I, what do I say? I mean, you all encounter this when you're talking to your friends who talk smack, and then you want to say to them, don't do that. But you've got to find a way that they can hear you. I'm looking to the young'uns. I know you're a young'un, but I want, I, want, I want some of the students first, okay? Any of you, like, you got advice for me? Please, really, I'm, I'm really serious. I need help to know how to have my moment with the Pope and, and let it have some impact. By the way, there's no guarantee I'll have my moment with the Pope. He may say, uh, not you. Uh, happens. Okay, go for Thank it. You. Wait for the microphone, because people online need to hear you. So if I remember correctly, back to my freshman year in philosophy class, I believe it was uh, a Buddhist idea of uh, giving someone the benefit of the doubt. Do you think there's any possible way that it could have been interpreted differently? or so like, it's That's kind of what I want to And ask. I think you're on to something, right? That I should give them, I should give them the, the credit, the benefit of the doubt, right? That, and, and I think maybe that's what Cardinal Koch was after. I know Cardinal Koch. We, you know, we, we eat together. We laugh together. Um, we've known each other for more than a decade. And if he says there was no offense, maybe I should really say, okay, there really was no offense. But I, and I wish I could give Pope Francis benefit of the doubt. But on my side of the argument, and I, I hope I made it clear that I really love Francis. I think he's just the most marvelous thing that's happened to the Jewish community in terms of somebody being pope. But you don't think he intended to offend, right? I don't think he intended to offend, but inadvertent offense is still offense. Yeah, sure. And maybe I'm higher, hi, hypersensitive, but I have 2,000 years of disrespect and hatred that kind of lead me to that, that kind of hypersensitivity. And I'm from the Jewish community that engages in dialogue, that you know, knows the New Testament, that has read what the Pope's written. Imagine the rest of the Jewish world who are just prickly about it because maybe they should be. So benefit of the doubt is not a bad path. I'm using a Buddhist term, a path, right? But I'm being honest with you, I'm not sure I can walk it. I wish I could. I'm not sure I can. And, and it's, for me, the stakes are very high because, and maybe I'm naive, I want the Pope to be pure. I want him to be as Catholic as the Pope, right? I want, I, I want him to not just be your Pope, I want him to be my Pope. And I kind of like what, what Cardinal Gregory said. If Sometimes you, friends make mistakes. It, yeah, and if you give him the benefit of the doubt, yeah, yeah. then it's not a teachable moment, right? Well, but one can say that friends do make mistakes. And I can say, I feel you are my friend and you are a friend to the Jewish people, but I also feel you made a mistake. Yes. Wait for the microphone. This is your moment. There's going to be 10,000 people online listening to you, but don't be nervous. So you were talking about what to say in your moment with the Pope, I think, to make it more meaningful if you... If you lead with how he has been such a good friend to the Jewish community and then follow it by saying how he has offended you, just based off knowing, I mean, a little bit about who he is, based off what he said as just following as a Catholic, I think that would be more meaningful to him, just knowing that So you were start a fan. with the compliment. Lead with, I know that you are a great friend to the Jews and I'm grateful for that. That's good. I mean, all in all, so far, really good advice, really useful advice, and I'm grateful for it. So expand in your head this moment. And it doesn't have to be about how you read the Good Samaritan. If you knew that you had three minutes with Pope Francis, what would you say? What would you ask him? What would you tell him? What would your prayer be? And I will tell you this, every single time I have met Pope Francis, he ended with the following words, Rabbi, pray for me, which is an awesome burden and, and a loving one. So ask yourself, oh, you, you, are you ready? What are you going to ask the Pope? Oh, we're going to do a dialogue? Two words. 
Ordain women. Ha, huh, okay, ordain women. And can I guess that Pope Francis would say, I wish I could? No, yeah, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. And he has moved women further than any pope has. And he's got a lot of theological and political issues. Um, I'm all in. I, I'm at a seminary that's been ordaining women for 40, 40 years. Is that right, Ellen? Is it about 40 years? It's 1985. 85, so 15 and 22 is 37 years. And I'm the first rabbi of the e egalitarian congregation where men and women counted equally. Women can lead prayer much as men could, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm, I'm a card-carrying feminist. Um, but I'm also aware of how difficult it was for us, with all the goodwill in the world, to get to that point, and how much both political and sometimes friendships broke over the issue. And the Pope, the Pope, I think, has to very carefully measure his political goodwill. He can only do so much as Pope. And if you want to watch him, watch who he's nominating and electing as cardinals. Because they're going to pick the next Pope. And he's picking his people. He's really trying to lay out the future so that his legacy will be preserved. He's very canny. And so that comes back to that gentleman who was, I guess, moved, um, who said that, you know, maybe this is an internal critique. So benefit of the doubt, internal critique, ordain women. Anything else we're going to say to the Pope? Yes. Honest repartee, you should say to Papa Francesco, which is the way I feel about him, as I can tell you do too, um, exactly what you've said here tonight, and give him a chance to either say, I'm sorry, you're right, because he did that about something he said in Chile. I, I think he's the first yeah. pope in 2,000 years to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Yeah. And in fairness to you, given the history of relations between Jews and Christians from 2,000 years ago, I think you should tell him exactly what you've said here because that might help Jewry worldwide who's feeling the same Thank thing you, you are. I think and that's it important. might instruct we as Christians to be a little more sensitive. So I, I, I'm, I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that most of the people in this room are Christian and likely Catholic. So of you, how many of you have had the opportunity to be at a public mass in St. Peter's Square? <laughs> yes, you've been? I was actually lucky enough to go with school um, on a trip to Italy, and my teacher somehow got us really good, like a really good spot to watch it, and it was really it was a really cool experience. So I, I want to say I've been many times in Rome at the public, the Wednesday Mass, and sometimes on the Sunday Mass, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in St. Peter's Square chanting "Papa Francisco, Papa Francisco." It's just it's amazing. And then he gives his blessing at the end of his homily. And for me, as a Jew who has seen the priests in my synagogue give the priestly blessing, so the Pope will, the bishops will come up and they'll name where their pilgrims are from. We have pilgrims, I've actually heard this, from Iona College in New Rochelle. And everybody from the college is screaming. And the Pope like zeroes in and he locks in on them and gives his blessing. I'm not a Catholic. <laughs> I'm really not a Catholic. But I have to tell you, for me, it's the closest I have ever come to understanding what it must have felt like when the priests in the temple 2,000 years ago beamed God's blessing through their fingers. That's my esteem for this man because he has it. And by the way, Benedict the same. I met Benedict. He was much more warm and fuzzy 
than I had any right to expect. Everything led me to think he'd be this austere German theologian. And he was a doll. He was lovely. And he had just come in like 99 degrees of heat. He was wearing a sombrero. I was just wearing a yarmulke. I got a terrible sunburn. Um, and just, just literally the lights beaming off of him. So I'm going to recommend a field trip for you guys. I think, I, I think Fairfield University has to come up with the, the cash and send you all to St. Peter's to just, if nothing else, just experience that. It will, it will really rev up your Catholic souls. Yes, I want one from the iPad. Yeah, we do. Hold on. Oh, I have, I have 12 online, so we won't get to all of them, but um, let's see. We, uh, How you, do you, you think? You did Hegel. You can do, you know, synthesis, antithesis, thesis, antithesis, just give and now me, do synthesis. Just give me 15 seconds, yeah. and I'll do that. But meantime... How do you think we can make up for young Catholics and Jews being unaware of the prior tragic relationship between them? Well, the first thing you can do is learn history. I assume you're assigned that here, um, and I assume you can watch it in the movies, and it's not that long ago. But you do need to know the tragic history of the relationship between our two people. On the other hand, how lovely it is that Catholics and Jews under the age, say, of 40, can think, well, of course they're my friends. Isn't that how it's always been? I mean, it's ignorant, but it's a great thought. So, you know, bravo for that. But I, I think we have to, as educators, get out there and teach and remind people of the history. And it's complicated. We all have complicated relations. At some point in your life, you will look back on your life and realize that you've had very, very important relations and boy, were they complicated. You know, if I think about my ex-wife, I have those kind of thoughts. Um, so, and I, and I do want to say, my loving wife is here now, and I, I, this is the most important voice I listen to. So thank you, Sandy, for being here and sitting in the back. But um, you need to know your history. And it's not just Jewish history. It's not just we were persecuted. It's you were the guys who were making the trouble, and you need to know that that's part of your legacy so that you don't commit the same theological error. You know, let me just jump in here. Vis-a-vis um, -vis what you just said, with us tonight is my colleague and friend, Dr. Patricia Berry, who has been teaching at Fairfield for a long time her course on the history of Christian anti-Semitism. Patricia, maybe you could share with, with Bert and the students who are here what you have found to be most valuable about teaching this course? A great question. Um, well, I'm not Jewish, and I'm not Christian. And I think what's been most interesting to me is seeing students really engage with the, with the issue. Um, and I think not coming from either of those traditions has been a help because um, I'm kind of a, you know, a neutral arbiter. Um, so I've watched students really grapple with uh, the history of the Christian church with regard to, uh, to its anti-Semitism. Uh, and they've done really, really good work lately, particularly in thinking about the resonance of this in the very modern world, in the contemporary world, um, and looking at anti-Semitism around the world today. Uh, I have not taught the course in a couple of years now, so I'll be curious when we confront you know, the most recent examples. But there's been an upsurge of anti-Semitic incidents. Um, and sometimes students know about those, and sometimes they don't. I had students be quite surprised about Charlottesville, mm. for example to hear that they, they, they had to be introduced by me to the videotape which showed uh, marchers shouting, Jews will not replace us. They, had, they did not know that. Um, but they've been very, very thoughtful, and that's, uh, I've appreciated that. I had a question, actually. But uh, can I comment first? And yeah. Then 
I, I also want to say to, to the Catholic kids in the room, I'm old enough to remember when there was a virulent anti-Catholic feeling in this country. When John F. Kennedy ran for president, a Catholic, boy, the Protestants came out swinging, and it was ugly. And, you know, you guys have been spared that. And it's good that you've been spared that, but you need to know that's part of the legacy of being here. We have a long, rich history of hatred, and we have to do something about loving our neighbor. Okay, now. Yeah, my question actually relates to my course, which is, um, I, I have my own thoughts about it, but I'm curious what your thoughts are about the letter that came out um, under the supervision of John Paul II uh, about the Shoah, um, in which the whole first half of the letter looked at the history of Jewish-Christian relations from his or his committee's point of view. The second half looks specifically at the Holocaust. Uh, and Christian uh, activity during the Holocaust. So how did you judge that letter? So I need to give a little bit of background. Like most Jews, although I'm probably better at it than most Jews, I don't know a whole lot about inside baseball in the church. And I kind of knew that there was this letter, but I never read it before. But as it happens, this semester, online, I'm obviously not in Rome um, because of COVID, I'm teaching a class at the Pontifical Gregorian University, a Jesuit university, and it's a dialogue course, and I'm, I'm co-teaching it with a priest, and we're reading all of these letters, and it's fascinating to see a Catholic grapple with the problem of the Holocaust, because on one hand, he knows that the Christian teaching of disdain for almost 2,000 years is partially responsible. On the other hand, no one in their right mind wants to say that Nazism was a form of Christianity. And by the way, I don't think any Jew wants to say that either. It was, I mean, Pope Benedict called it paganism. It was one of the worst moments of humanity, much like we're seeing Russians in Ukraine now. So we experience hate, and then we experience the fact that the church can nevertheless be big enough to express regret. That's huge. As it happens in this class, in this dialogue class, we have a Confucian Chinese woman. And we wait to hear her because she speaks as a neutral. And she can say, wow, you Catholics and you Jews, you guys are crazy, <laughs> which is sometimes her comment, and she's not entirely wrong. But um, your point is well taken. The fact that a pope in a series of popes since the Second Vatican Council in 1965 have grappled with the church's behavior towards the Jews is profound and powerful, and I think a sign of the greatness of the Catholic Church. But um, the letter strikes me as a kind of moment like your experience of the Good Samaritan and the, and the reaction to Galatians and so forth, in that the letter purports to be a grappling with the Holocaust, but when in its first half it looks at the history of Christians and Jews, it does something very interesting rhetorically, and I've used it, I've had students that analyze it at the end of the semester, use that letter, and say, how, how did the church do on this? Did they yeah. get the history right or not? And um, what it does is it's very, very specific about circumstances in which there were Christians who helped Jews, mm -hmm. and very, very general when it comes to cases of, uh, of complicity, right? It also uses the passive voice, you know, mistakes, mistakes were made, were made. Yes. right? Um, and, and so it uses, you know, with not an, I, I don't think in a conscious effort to be nefarious, but in a, in a way that you see the writers quite uncomfortable so with facing up to the reality. I, I, I'm glad you brought this up, be, and because it underscores what uh, th this gentleman over here said, that maybe we need to give the benefit of the doubt. Um, I happen to like Timothy Dolan, my, my local Cardinal Archbishop. I probably disagree with him politically on everything. 
but I would have a beer with him in a heartbeat. He's just a good guy, and he's easy to be with, and his love of his religion and his people is palpable. And I think while we do need to know our history and while we do need to admit to the details, we also need to find a way to move beyond the dialogue of grievance. It's too easy to just kvetch. And I know I did some of that tonight, but I hope I've also done justice to the fact that Pope Francis and Pope Benedict before him and all the way back um, have been extraordinary leaders of the church in that they have turned the church's teaching of disdain and disrespect for the Jews into not only something positive, but to something that is not just leading to, but has resulted in genuine friendship. And, you know, I think that's a good place for us to end on friendship and love. We think so, too. So thank you. You want to say something? No. I just really want to thank all of you who came out this evening. Thank those people who are virtually with us as well. And really thank Rabbi Vysotsky for being with us. Uh, this was really wonderful, Bird. And thank you for, for somebody who just retired, you don't sound as if you're just retired, but... <laughs> and before anyone gets up to leave, one more thank you. So this is the 16th and last Jewish Christian engagement lecture that Ellen and I will do together because Ellen is now retiring at the end of this year. Yes. Such a young age. So this is my thank you for all of these events. Well, thank you, Paul. Our friendship is going to continue long after I've retired, but after both of us have retired. But again, Thank you all for being with us.